it was a serious dose of naivete. So I think that like my fearlessness or my, my naivete for the industry too has basically converged at that point. And even when we got the project, that sort of beginner's mind, that beginner's lens and that naivete really served as really important tools for our success as, um, yeah. an, as, as like a design agency, if you will. Welcome to SheEO.World, a podcast about redesigning the world. I'm your host, Vicki Saunders. In each episode, you'll hear from SheEO Venture founders, women who are working on the world's to-do list. These innovative business leaders are solving some of the major challenges of our times. Sit back and prepare to be inspired. So today we're here with Chelsea Briganti from Lollyware. Hi, Chelsea. Hi, Vicki. One of the things I often start with is just so, did you always know that you were going to invent an alternative to plastic? <laughs> I definitely did not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how did you get here? What was the path? Mm-hmm. Tell us more. You know, I grew up in Hawaii, so I have always been half mermaid, if you will, in, in so that I'm always just really drawn to water. And I remember looking through old baby photos and seeing my bassinet on the beach. That gives you a little bit of indication of when my journey with the ocean and being near the water and the sounds began. So basically as like a, as a newborn and my mom found that this was really the only sound that would calm me down. So grew up in Hawaii, obviously in love with the marine environment and all the magic that's there. And uh, went on to kind of have a little bit of a zigzag path, if you will. I was always a very imaginative child, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Moved from Hawaii to New York to kind of figure it out. I was always really inspired by New York City. And while there, I had all sorts of weird jobs. I was a fashion stylist for um, <laughs> for Toshiba and I took all kinds of weird gigs. I worked at a vegan restaurant. I designed jewelry. And all the while for about, you know, three to four years in New York City, trying to figure out, you know, what my path might be. And that's when I stumbled upon industrial design and a a program that was offered at Parsons School of Design, which is sort of like, it's a well-known institution, kind of like the Harvard of design schools. So I I was trying to see if I might be able to get into this school. I applied to a bunch of different design schools. So I spent the summer of 2006 um, taking art classes and drawing classes uh, so that I could get the acceptance into Parsons. And then I eventually got accepted in the fall of 2006. And that began my journey of understanding how design might be used as a tool to create a better world. And that's sort of, I think I'll leave it at that. And I'm sure you have some comments on that. Yeah. (laughs) That's just so fascinating. And so we're, I mean, so you were creative when you were getting started. You were, I mean, one of the things I often wonder about for people that are sort of inventor types and creators is I often see that they synthesize a lot of different experiences. And so your path of trying a bunch of things feels like very in line. I mean, certainly Mm -hmm. that's what happened with me. I tried tons of different stuff. Were you always passionate about the environment? Mm, so super curious to, on that note, super curious and imaginative and always, like you said, trying new things and not being afraid to be bad at them. I think that, that's a, definitely a theme in the work um, mm-hmm. and learning a lot from failure. In terms of being an environmentalist, for me, it didn't register because nature is my religion. And I don't, you know, I don't, I never necessarily didn't, didn't really think about calling myself an environmentalist, although I guess by definition, I might be, but really just having reverence for nature, uh, believing that there's a deep intelligence that's pre-existed humans on earth that has evolved over billions of years and that she knows more than we do. And she has, you know, I believe there are two, two ways to uncover secrets. One is in nature and one is in people. So I believe, you know, strongly and that, that nature has these secrets and I am very curious and excited to uncover them through different fields, like whether it be biomimicry, where you use design uh, sorry, you use solutions found in nature and you apply them to solve human problems. I like grew up running across lava fields and wanting to be a volcanologist, wanting to explore all these weird kind of esoteric natural platforms of jobs. Okay. I've just got this image in my head of like running across lava, nature, tell me your secrets, <laughs> uh, you know, like birthing the, what, what is next? What is this sort of founder story of Lollyware? Where did that come from? So you, I assume you had all kinds of design projects as you went through school, but but where did this sort of the nugget of this idea come from? 
So I graduated number one in my class at Parsons and I am, I forgot to mention along with a na- like nature as my religion, I'm also deeply a science nerd. Trying to understand the secrets of nature, you can look at that through a scientific lens and, really, you know, un- uncovering those kinds of secrets through in that way. And so when I was in college, I, I did my thesis on this notion of developing a device that would empower women to collect and store their own stem cells. So I worked with Columbia University to develop this device. I won thesis of the year for that. And that, that project really propelled me forward into how can I intelligently combine different fields to innovate. And that became something I became really passionate about. So Madame Wassell, with a C-E-L-L at the end, that project that I just mentioned, combined industrial design, tissue engineering, hardcore stem cell science. So I became very knowledgeable on stem cells and understanding what kind of stem cells are found in menstrual blood, which are called um, multipotent stem cells. So you, so out of the menstrual lining, you can generate eight different kinds of stem cells. And this has been stigmatized for a long time, although it's a bio treasure. I graduated with this thesis under my belt. My first big press piece was in Fast Company the day after I graduated. And then eventually I sold that invention to a menstruation company. And then when I graduated, I had three really close friends in college, all women, Monica, Ingrid, and Leanne. And we decided to form a think tank called The Way We See the World. So a really long, fun, fun title, again, being kind of silly about it, but also a serious lens on how we could use design to solve the world's problems. So, you know, how do we all see the world differently? We're all come from very diverse backgrounds. So we graduate. We're all in industrial design and engineering. I have this cool portfolio project. We have a little bit of, um, you know, some steam behind us and I decide, well, what brand do I think really needs our help? Pepsi Cola. They uh, have a very wasteful packaging portfolio. They make a lot of unhealthy things. Maybe they need us. So I fished around for Inder Noi, who was the CEO at the time, the CEO of Pepsi. And I found her email and I emailed her a cold email. Hey, Indra, think that you should hire us to reimagine the future of Pepsi. And she emailed us, I want to say it was like 25 minutes later. And that's how we first got a big project with Pepsi, uh, working across really cool stuff. Like we would reimagine their packaging. We were working across healthy food and beverage. And that that was really uh, an important time for us to wet our palates and to get to know who we were as a design team. Unbelievable. So, okay, let's talk about fear for a minute, just to pause. <laughs> so, or, or, your, or your lack of it. I find this completely delicious that you're bold enough to go, you know what, who's the biggest company that could use my brain? I think Pepsi, (laughs) (laughs) which is just so awesome. So like, how did you think about writing that email, the hooking of people and getting them excited about and like being able to communicate your vision in an email format to get someone to respond is like a serious art. So do you have any insight for us on how you did that? Yeah, I think that it was a serious dose of naivete. When I channel that moment, it's like I'm going through a water tunnel and not really worrying about anything but being in the moment and really trying to experience that. And so I think that like my fearlessness or my, you know, my naivete for the industry too is, has basically converged at that point. And I, I don't even remember what I wrote. I could probably look it up, but even when we got the project, that that sort of beginner's mind, that beginner's lens and that naivete really served as really important tools for our success as, um, yeah. an, as like a design agency, if you will. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, this idea of beginner's mind is something that I think about, you know, if there's one thing I could uh, try and bring back is how I felt the first time I did a startup where I had no idea, right? And so the more experience you have, sometimes the harder it is to get back to beginner's mind. So yeah, that is really uh, an amazing thing to have. So, okay, you're, you ping Indra, she responds, OMG. And now all of a sudden you're at Pepsi. What was that like? Did you have your own kind of lab? Like, how did you enter into that? Clearly this was, you created a job for yourself that didn't exist. Mm Mm-hmm. So we became the partners for Pepsi's innovation team externally because what we learned was the way that big companies innovate is either through incrementalism or through acquisition. What we found out through churning out, I would say, tens of thousands of 
like what you would call breakthrough ideas. So when you're in the innovation industry, they codify ideas by either tier one, tier two, tier three ideas. And you want to be in tier one, which is a breakthrough idea. So we were kind of, we kind of evolved to be a breakthrough innovation lab think tank. And we're on the inside of Pepsi and we know we very quickly noticed that like we're total weirdos and that it's really hard to help them move the needle. Now we went on to do this same process, of course, with new learnings with Coca-Cola, with Nestle, with Pernod Ricard, with a lot of top hundred CPGs. Alongside of these like big corporate projects which were funding us, funding the consultancy, we were entering into design competitions to get the name out there so we could continue to get consulting work. And that's when Lollyware was born. Did Lollyware come from a, like a problem or uh, something that you had surfaced as an idea from one of those projects or out of the blue? Or like, did you start obsessing about plastics in the ocean or how did that come about? I've always been like, a, like I said, like concerned about the environment. I read an article one day that said 33 billion plastic cups enter the ocean every year. And I shared it with the team and I, I was like, this is going to be a huge problem. We have to like kind of figure this out. At the same time, we, you know, we, we had a focus on sustainability already. We already cared about it, as, as you know. And at the same time, I saw a design competition for Jell-O. And Kraft was putting on a design competition. And there were two rules. You had to use a gel-like material and it had to be like a novel application. So we thought, oh my God, this is going to be so fun. We just read that article. Why don't we make an edible cup out of wow. Jello? <laughs> cool. So one day in the office kitchen, we bought a bunch of different. I learned are now called hydrocolloids, which means just like a, any kind of gelling material. So we bought Jello packets. We bought agar agar, which is a, a red algae. We bought a few other things, and we were basically just playing in the office kitchen. I took two solo cups and I stacked them together to create just like a. A quick mold, you know, because my background in industrial design, like you kind of already know how to make things. We made a quick algae mixture, poured it around the two solo cups and let it set. And that afternoon we took a peek and we thought, wow, isn't that cool? We just made a gel cup, like an edible cup. And we entered the competition and because we are very much, well, at the time we were all really excited about the experiential level of design. So we did, did fun flavors and colors. That would be more fun. Like, why would someone want to eat their cup? Well, what if it were flavored? Let's incent them to di- make it disappear. We entered the competition. They had to, like, it was such a weird idea. They had to make a new category for us. To make a long story short, we won third place, a hundred bucks, got back to the office, Went out to dinner. The hundred bucks didn't even cover the dinner, but it was fun. And we went on to consulting work the next day. Didn't think anything about it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and then what happened? And then <laughs> yeah. what happened? So, yeah. Yeah, I know. So the competition was covered by press and the cup went viral. Two months later, we were in Time Magazine as one of the best scientific inventions of the year. And we were getting orders from millions of cups. And I was writing funny emails like, that's so cool. This is just an idea. Thanks so much. We'll get in touch with you if we ever commercialize this idea. And that continued for two years. So we continued consulting to pay the bills. And then Lollyware just kept getting tons and tons of interest. And it just became clear that Lollyware had legs and that it could be something other than a side project or a contest. And so basically like the evolution story of Lollyware is like kind of competition to billion dollar company. Right. That's just amazing. Well, and I think this is one of my favorite phrases, as you know, is follow the energy. You're just doing something and all of a sudden everybody's coming at you saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. Right. And I think it's one of my favorite leadership approaches is you just like follow that energy. Right. You're like, in fact, it's sometimes I think when you come up with something you can't stop it from happening, right? It's just like, that's a natural, it's kind of like following the rules of nature. It's wanted. I love so that. Everyone's emailing you. And did you have the name Lollyware at that time too? No, th- at that time. And I've all, I was always tasked in the company with naming everything. It's always been kind of a fun side project <laughs> for me. And so first it was Jellaware. Then we got a cease and desist from Kraft. And we're like, you can't use that. Let's do Lollyware. It sounds more fun. And it evokes this notion of tableware and edibility. Because lolly in Europe actually means like something sweet or <laughs> something yeah. edible, like a candy. So we thought it'd be cute. Um, and plus it has LOL in it, which makes you laugh when you say it. That's so good. Awesome. So now the big challenge is, oh my God, you were playing in your kitchen and came up with something. How do you actually take something like this to market? 
So this is, I guess, where the science nerd seriously kicks in. And where did you go from there? Like, how did you get to the next level? You know, there were so many consulting projects going on at this time. We were really kind of killing it in the sustainable design consulting space. And we had projects going on with about 12 or so other small, medium, large companies. And I was always managing the leads, if you will, coming in through for Lollyware. So I was really managing Lollyware the whole time. And I was like, hey, girls, I think we should talk. I'm really jazzed about all the interest Lollyware is receiving. And I want to I wanna turn this into its own company. I don't want to do consulting anymore. So I could sit down and Ingrid said, that sounds great. I don't want to do that. Monica said, that sounds great. I actually want to leave the company and go do this other thing. And then Leanne says, I want to join Chelsea and take Lollyware. So we basically divided all of our assets. Leanne and I got Lollyware, everything Lollyware related. And then uh, Ingrid took everything on the consulting and we basically divided and conquered. Ingrid moved along with the way we see the world, which is still in existence and she's still doing a great job with it. And Leanne and I took the helm of Lolly at Lollyware. And at this time, it's just unreal. Press every week, investor interest every week, like potential orders. And we decide that we're going to raise money. And that's where that's when Shark Tank contacted us and said, hey, we want you to apply to the show. All right. <laughs> so when you went on Shark Tank, did you actually have a product? So we basically, I kind of left this out. When Leanne and I took the helm, we joined an incubator kitchen to be able to produce prototypes and samples. And we just wanted to keep momentum. So we did that for a while. Then we graduated to another kitchen called the Organic Food Incubator. To make a long story short, when we went on Shark Tank, we could make 500 cups a day, All right. which is not a lot. Yeah, not <laughs> a lot. Imagine. Yeah, but it is like so when we went on Shark project, Tank. right? So you can say, this is possible. Yeah. Now we just need money to scale up. Yes, that's right. We have the interest. We have the demand. Now we need money to scale and let's do this. And so when we went on Shark Tank, we said to ourselves, we really want Mark Cuban to invest in us. He's most, he's most aligned with us on technology and on innovation. And we think he has a lot of great sales leads, all the stadiums and sporting that he's involved in, the hotels, etc. We went on Shark Tank and whole round was like a million dollars in notes. That got us set up. And then we faced a lot of challenges with scaling the cup. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, yeah. and so like, how do you... It's so technical to get to that next level, right? So yeah. did you partner with labs? Did you partner with, did you hire people? Like, how did you think about solving that problem? Like staying in your expertise and then surrounding yourself with what you needed? I learned so much. And one day I'll write a book about this, but Leanne and I never were good at really knowing who to bring on when. I think that's a real, like a real yeah. skill that I've honed in on over the years is like, who do we need and when, and what are we good at? And what do we, what do we suck at? had a lot of problems with uh, like understanding that that aspect of it um we floundered a lot with operational consultants food science consultants got screwed over a bunch encountered bad people everything that could have gone wrong did and <laughs> we definitely learned a bunch and okay so uh, you know when you think about why startups fail there's typically a few reasons so you run out of gas you run out of money poor leadership or not pivoting fast enough and i think to give us credit, we knew when to pivot away from the cup and into a new material and a new product that was easier to scale and more timely. That, and that's the, really the pivot from the cup to the straw, which occurred in 2017. Was your vision that you're going to replace every plastic straw on the planet? Is that how you started thinking about that with straws? Or tell us what was going through your mind as you did that pivot. What was going through my mind was that we were producing $4 cups and we really needed to get down to a very inexpensive material cost. And in order to do that, cheaper inputs and a scalable product that that could be extruded. I assembled a team of bioengineers, chemists, food technologists, uh, even a seaweed biologist. And we formed a, a contracted team of experts. And we worked with them for 18 months and we eventually pivoted from using red algae to using brown algae, which is derived from kelp, which is massively cheaper and just a better utilization of seaweed for so many different reasons, aside from cost and performance. So we did that. We we successfully pivoted to the straw with a new material. And I guess what was going through our minds for, was that at the time, you know, straws were just beginning to get banned and at such a high velocity 
product of 360 billion per year, gosh, even if we could replace 10%, wouldn't that be a huge win? And that's what we're focused on now, replacing 36 billion straws. What is the path to market for something like that? Like, how do you, you know, you're not opening a lollyware store. So is it, are you licensing the formula? What's your plan around how you get to 36 billion straws? Oh my God, saying it out loud. That's a lot of straws. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we learned a lot from being an end-to-end manufacturer of the cup that it's really hard. Uh, We don't want to be manufacturers. We want to be an innovation technology company. So we pivoted from not only the cup to the straw, but from end-to-end manufacturing to licensing. So now what we have created is a really delicious licensing package, which allows a plastic manufacturer to license the material patents and the process patents from us. And what we do is we, we allow them to make the straw and then we bring a lot of brand equity and demand. So it's not like, hey, license this, we think there's a market. It's license this and service our customers. This year, we'll launch with Marriott, Pernod Ricard, PS1, Momus, and a couple others I can't mention. And then next year is like a really big corporate play once we come down the cost curve with our scaled production. So for a licensing company, that means I'm not making straws. So that's great. So how did we do that? So we basically developed our pilot line, which comes online in January 2020, which allows us to make 100 million straws a year. And that first pilot line will be with the licensee. And then we'll be working on Gen 2 to get to more volume. But it gives you a sense of like, by January, we're making a lot of straws. That's fantastic. We are in a real hurry to solve for these challenges, right? Our oceans are full. I mean, you recently went on a bit of an expedition to one of these awful places in the ocean where there's a ton of plastic that's been gathered. I don't know what the right term is for it, but do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've seen out in the ocean and why this is so important to you? Yes. So I was recently down in Bermuda for the Ocean Plastic Leadership Summit, and I'm diving out in a zone where it's 6,000 feet deep. I'm diving, you know, around this garbage patch and there's so much plastic in the water, small pieces, fragments called microplastics that it seems it feels like I'm in a snow globe. So it's just swirling around my face, tiny tiny little pieces of plastic. And the reason why it's such a huge issue um is that those tiny pieces can never really be recovered. They can never be you never clean that up given it their scale. As a result, our marine life is dying. You know, whales are dying, dolphins, small marine life, sea turtles are literally filled with plastic. And then when we eat fish that come from that environment, humans are ingesting plastic. So it's estimated that every week, even humans are ingesting a credit card size amount of microplastic. So it's a global health concern. It's so serious alongside like this alongside global warming. Like I, it's, it's a really important time to step up with very big ideas to solve these problems. And Lollyware is just one of millions of companies that are in the sustainability field that are absolutely critical to creating this ecosystem of solutions. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the things that we talk about at CEO, how important it is. So, I mean, as a young person listening to the podcast, as anybody listening to this podcast, I'm thinking about at this moment in time in the world, as it is right now, how are you using your leadership to create a better world and to solve what we call the world's to-do list? So first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for doing what you're doing. And can you, if you were going to, you know, you've got a lot of listeners here, what is it that you would like them to think about and to do to change their behavior so that we can all be part of this change? First is really important to understand is that the the scaling of any sort of sustainable product is so difficult and that consumers, people have, can vote with their dollar by supporting, you know, new sustainable technologies, whether it be Lollyware whether it be Tesla or other solutions out there, Alginet, like s- sustainable textiles, like voting with your dollar is very important and empowering. And so I think number one, choose to purchase products that are creating a better world. And number two, refuse single use plastic in general. So when you're out, bring your own cup. When you're getting takeout, try to bring your own containers. I know that sometimes that's a challenge, but there are so many beautiful options out there now that enable you to do so. And Lollyware, certainly when we look at the options to single-use plastic, we see really interesting things happening. What Lollyware falls into, which is like bio-based alternatives to plastic, and you've got the reusables movement. And both are super critical 
given the acceleration of our single use culture. And especially when you look at areas around the world, like, you know, around Asia, for example, that's accelerating quickly. You hear about China's, the greatest impact of the internet on China is plastic waste. So meaning food delivery, you know, how do we tackle that problem? So the straw is really just the beginning. It's the first touch point of a huge category that we're developing at Lolly, where we've developed over 65 different materials derived from kelp, ranging from like hard plastic replacements to flexible film technologies. And we're looking for licensing partners for every category. Do you have some of this stuff up on your website for people to look at, or is it all pretty internal at the moment? We're overhauling our website. I'm super excited about this project. It's an eight-week long project. And it's going to have all sorts of really fun things like where can you find Lollywear Straw? Because we're a B2B play, but we're also a plastic-free movement. We love to engage people to share with them like, hey, are you at the MoMA? Are you near the MoMA? You can find Lollywear Straw there. Are you going to be staying at the Marriott? You can find Lollywear Straw there. So there'll be a lot of fun UX as part of this new website overhaul that we're working on. So Vicky, I'll make sure to share that with you and we can maybe put it, put it in the, the blog notes when it okay. launches. Yeah. But the best place to find us for most up-to-date information is on Instagram. So I'd love to keep in touch with everyone on Instagram. Instagram, you're at Lollywear, L-O-L-I-W-A-R-E. You got it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for your time, for your brilliant mind, for your love of nature. We are so grateful for that. And for somehow getting nature to share some of her secrets with you so that you can bring this beautiful product to market. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. It's such an honor to be a CEO venture. And I continue to be so inspired by this community that you've created. It indeed is the future. And I was recently at the UN for World Ocean Day. And the head of UN Women had a beautiful quote that I want to end on, which is, we need more women in leadership to solve the problems of the ocean. And I fundamentally believe that we bring a different lens and that the statistics of startups failing is predominantly based on male leadership and that CEO represents a new model that Lollywear is proud to be a part of to reverse that statistic that Mm -hmm. more women-led companies will be successful because our leadership and our skill sets are unique. And especially with regard to solving the problems of the ocean and the, you know, the technology that's needed to do that. So thank you so much. And I, I also welcome everyone to understand more deeply the sustainable development goals that Vicky mentioned, the world to-do list. Lollywear is proud to be addressing number nine, number 12, and number 13 and 14. And when, we, when you think about ideas as young people, as young women, think about those 17 goals. What does the world need? What needs to exist right now to solve those goals? And I believe that's a beautiful framework that CEO has incorporated and that Lollywear is definitely implementing. So lots of love to everyone listening. Please reach out to us on Instagram and we look forward to keeping in touch with everyone. Thank you, Chelsea. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the CEO.world podcast. If this conversation resonated with you, please share it with a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. If you'd like more information about CEO, please visit us at CEO.world. That's S-H-E-E-O dot world.